Stop Now, a social experiment enterprise. Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Stop Now. I have my co-host over here, JK. Say hey, JK. Hi, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, Welcome today. I'm glad to have you today since um, Nate is busy for the day and that's fine. (laughs) But um, I'm Melissa, your regular host, and we have some two very special guests today because we're going to get into some interesting topics today. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, someone who has not been on our show yet. Um, Dr. Daryl Ray, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Well, hi, Melissa. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Daryl Ray, and I'm the founder of Recovering from Religion and the author of uh, several books on uh, the impact of religion on people's lives and behavior and our culture. So uh, that's the short story. I don't know how much you want from me. <laughs> All right, and we have a returning guest. Hey, Carl, how you doing? I'm good, good, good. A quick, uh, quick update on that. So oh. I've been longing for... Uh, having a call uh, to debate with. And I wanted someone like uh, Aaron Ray, uh, who's a great inspiration and a source of energy. And uh, I would like him to talk more about his uh, book and the audio uh, that is available in Audible, uh, The God Virus, and also Sex and God. So those are the crucial things. And if he can enlighten us with this vision like why he calls the god virus and then we will go from there like with our conversation is excuse me i'm going to begin with an apology which i most never do my voice is about to go out i've been kind of semi-sick all week so i thought i'd be ready to jump on this and be enthusiastic and loud and proud but uh not today i don't think so we'll uh We'll go with it. And if I have to excuse myself and leave, it's probably because, not because I don't like you guys, it's because I'm fucking feeling bad. <laughs> Just with <it> that way. <laughs> it's okay. We understand. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I was anxious to talk to you and uh, appreciate JK's question there. I'll, I'll start off by just saying that I was born in a very religious home. My grandfather was a country church preacher. For 45 years, my my aunts, uncles, everybody, my parents became missionaries when they retired even. And I, I, I was, my family was loving and caring um, in many ways. I, I can't, I wasn't damaged by them, uh, but I did see how religion hurt them in ways they didn't even know it was hurting them. And as a result, uh, as I got out, I wanted to be a minister, but I wanted to be a liberal minister. I was never going to be a fundamentalist minister because I never bought, I never bought the bullshit. It just, the earth 6,000 years old just made absolutely no sense to me. And that seems to be a pretty important thing for at least the religious groups I grew up in. So as I got out of uh, college, I went to seminary to become a minister. The trouble is after two years of going to seminary, I realized uh, even the little bit that I did believe was probably false and certainly not not something I could verify with any kind of uh, logical way. So I stayed in liberal religion. I even was a preacher, uh, a substitute preacher for a while. Uh, I have the singular distinction though, Melissa, of never having been asked to come back and preach a second time in a church because my, my, my sermons were way too liberal. <laughs> I, I simply could not tell them what they wanted to hear. <laughs> so I didn't get, I didn't, didn't get asked to come back and preach. And after um, getting divorced uh, at the age of 38, I realized I don't have to stay religious. My wife was religious. My grandparents, my parents, my, everybody was religious. So I just said, I'm, I'm leaving this stuff and pretty much left it. But over the next 20 years of my life, I'm, I'm 39 and holding, by the way, I, uh, realize just how much religion continually Im- impacts our culture and our lives. And of course, everybody believes that their religion is the good one and everybody else is the bad one. And all the Catholics believe it's the Protestants going to hell and the Protestants believe the Catholics going to hell and the Hindus know everybody's going to hell. So after a while, you start really looking at this and that's what I was doing. I was looking at it 
from an anthropological and a sociological and a psychological standpoint. I'm a psychologist by training, but my graduate, my undergraduate degrees are both in anthropology and, and uh, sociology. So I, I really look at the world in a really broad framework. I'm not just looking at it psychologically. And if you really take a look at religion per se, the way it functions, the Mormon religion functions very much the same as the Catholic religion. And the Catholic religion looks a whole lot like, um, you know, the Baptist religion. And of course, the Muslim religion looks a lot like the Mormon religion because it was partly based on it. So you, these things are all interrelated and they act a lot alike. Uh, and then I started studying the, a, a very old book, been around since 1959, called, um, called um, Battle for the Mind. It was written by a British psychiatrist as he studied the brainwashing techniques of of South Korea or North Korea during the Korean War. And uh, it's a long story. I could go into hours talking to you guys about this. But what he basically what he, he showed in his book unintentionally, actually, he didn't. Uh, it wasn't the purpose of the book was he showed how religious groups have actually pioneered the work of what we now call brainwashing. And that's the popular term. I don't use the term technically, by the way. But it is a indoctrination methodology that religions all use. And it was clearly documented by the Methodist founder, Charles Wesley and John Wesley, clear back in the 1700s. We have evidence going clear back to biblical times. You can even see the brainwashing techniques actually espoused in many ways in the New Testament. So we know these, these techniques have been around for, for centuries, if not thousands of years. And then when you start looking at, well, how did the Methodist church get started? And then how did the Mormon church get started? How did the Catholic church get started? How did the Mo Muslim religion get started? And you realize the techniques are almost identical. It doesn't matter. It's not a God. It's not a supernatural thing that's happening. It's a good psychological methodology for indoctrinating people in, in beliefs that are then, you know, then pr propagated from, from person to person. And that's why I wrote my book, the God virus. How do, how, do, how do religions spread? That was the fundamental question I had. If you think about it, we are, we're in the best example of how do viruses spread right now. We've been in the middle of a COVID pandemic. This is not the first pandemic that hit the earth. We've had the bubonic plague. We had the Justinian plague. Uh, we had the, um, the Spanish flu. You name it. There's been so many pandemics and, and epidemics throughout history. And if you ever look at how viruses spread and then study how do religions spread, they spread in the same way. I mean, when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door and knocks on it, they want to sneeze on you, they want to get you to catch their disease, their Jehovah's Witnesses disease. Same thing for Mormons. When they come and knock on your door, they're trying to get you to give you their disease. And when Baptists come and give you a chick track, they want you to catch their disease. So all these things can be looked at as the spreading of a, what we now know, or what I call a viral ideology. And we see it in the internet. You know, when a meme goes viral, we know what that means nowadays. But by the way, Islam went viral. <laughs> Islam exploded. Islam grew far faster than Christianity did. Uh, Christianity spread fairly fast, but Islam just put a new, a new speed, you know, speedometer on the process. And it spread, it spread as far as Christianity did in much shorter time. So that would be what we could say going viral. Islam went viral. Catholicism went viral when uh, Martin Luther named his 95 Thesis to the wall. Lutherism went viral. It, it, we, we know these things from the internet, but we can just take that concept and look at how things have spread in the past. I mean, you think about it, the the minute a boat shows up in Genoa, Italy in 1348, uh, the pandemic, the, the bubonic plague starts spreading and it went, quote, viral. In the next three years, probably 40, 50 million people died of, of the bubonic plague. Well, people aren't dying necessarily from religion, but they are catching a brain disease. And each disease is unique. I mean, the Hindu disease is different than the Muslim disease. But there are diseases that, that change our perceptions of reality. You know, the earth is flat. The earth is 6,000 years old. Prayer cures this disease. You know, that's kind of stuff. 
those are not functional beliefs to walk around the earth with. If you want to, if you want to cure COVID, you get the CDC involved and find the best way to, to create the vaccine. You don't ask the local priest to cure the, to cure it just, but that's what they did. That's what they've done in the past. And they continue to do that. We can see ministers claiming their church cures the disease when it's right on television. You don't have to Google it too far. Anyway, I've gone on long enough here, JK. I hope that gives you a basic understanding though I can go on for hours. Uh, yeah, I will play the devil's advocate here. Like I'm going to uh, not take any sides, but then I'm going to ask you the critical questions, right? So uh, are you not offending people uh, everywhere, like uh, the whole of humanity, which believes in God itself, um, making them to a, a minuscule, like saying that like God is a virus kind of thing. And it's from your statement itself, right? It seems like it's a part of an evolutionary process, right? So the human brains have adapted to all these concepts. So wh why is that like wrong? And why are you uh, offending people by saying God is a virus? Well, I, I don't offend people. <clears throat> offend people, people decide to be offended themselves. I have Republican friends and I, I can, I can, I criticize Republicans all the time. If they want to get, re if they want to get offended about me criticizing Republicans, that's not my problem. Um, they criticize me. I'm a liberal Democrat. They, if I want to get offended at their criticism of being a Democrat, that's my problem. It's not theirs. I mean, here's the deal. Ideas, ideas are not human. Ideas exist outside of who you are. You know, you could be a Catholic today and you could be a Hindu. You could convert to be a Hindu tomorrow. So you, ideas move and they move between brains. And if, if we cannot criticize ideas, then we don't understand the basic foundations of a liberal democracy. I mean, that's kind of where we got this whole idea from the, the enlightenment, you know, that ideas are here to be challenged and criticized and refined and tested and let's, let me be frank, a Christian idea is nothing more than a Christian idea. It's an idea just like a Muslim idea is an idea. And if I can't, if I can't draw a comic of Muhammad, if I can't criticize Islam, if I get my head cut off or somebody shoots me because I don't agree with their Islamic tradition or their Islamic rules, is uh, most Christians understand that it's okay to criticize Islam. But what they don't look at is say, wait, criticizing Islam is no different than criticizing being a Baptist or criticizing being a Catholic. They're just ideas. Let's not personify ideas. And you get this in the laws of the, especially we see this in Islamic states where the laws talk about insulting religious feelings. Well, religions don't have feelings. Humans have feelings. Religions don't have feelings. Religions are simply an ideology. Communism was an ideology. Christianity is an ideology. There's no difference. They're just ideas and ideas need to be criticized. Daryl, I, so, I want to uh, stop right there. Like, and sure. call, call. Uh, you can ask any question on that. So Daryl, you are mentioning that, right? So God is an idea then, right? So you mean to say like, there is no God? God is just a concept? I don't care if there's a God or not. That's irrelevant. God is an idea. And which God are we talking about? Are we talking about the Allah? Are we talking about Yahweh? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Are we talking about any of the 10,000 gods of Hinduism? Which God are we talking about? And most people think they know what their God is. But if you ask the person next to them, is that your God? They'll say, no, my God's this. You know, every God is made in the image of the person talking about that God in most cases. How do you feel, Carl? What's your, you know, take on everything? I remember you are Christian, am I correct? Correct. Okay. So unashamedly. <laughs> well, I'm an I'm unashamedly Democrat, and so we're equal on that case. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your take on that? That you know, God and religion is just an idea. I don't disagree with anything so far uh, Daryl has said. Uh, 
ideas would be challenged, criticized, refined, and it doesn't have to be religion. It could be the Hatfields and the McCoys. You're right. <laughs> Hatfields tried to kill the McCoys uh, because they had a ideology that was infiltrated, we can call it a virus, with bad thinking. The problem with ideas is that get exposed to humans and humans are the ones a virus is something that goes into an organism and turns into something else or something dangerous. And so once a human gets an idea, they'll turn it into something else. And most religion, if you really look at it and study it, evolves. It's never stable. It's never the same. Uh, it's not even stable now for what it used to be. Right now, Christian theology says the earth is 14 billion years old. In the ghetto, they have a thing that uh, people say something that said, now you take that, bam, boom. Well, that's the Big Bang Theory nowadays. So, so far, I don't have anything to disagree with. Um, I think that Dr. Uh, Darrell uh, would have the same uh, idea that I have is I have a right to think like I think. I have a right to investigate it, stand up for it, and change my mind if I want to. Okay. Okay, Carl. I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna nominate you as an honorary co-author of my book. <laughs> I think you have just described my book about as well as anybody does that's never read it, probably. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, before we take this uh, to the next level, Carl, are you backtracking or playing it out <laughs> uh, on the safe zone? Get offended on this, right? So, but many people get offended when we talk about uh, sex and how the religion controls uh, sexuality of the humans. And uh, the question to Daryl on that is, uh, what made you to write this book, like Sex and God? It's uh, pretty yeah. controversial. Yeah, this is probably the most controversial book I've ever written. Um, although I, I like to write controversial stuff, it's fun. Uh, I, I, but I, when I write a book, for example, JK, my, my uh, <clears throat> philosophy is when I write a book, everything I write in that book will be good for five years. So I'm very careful about the science I use, uh, the peer-reviewed articles, everything I look at. I want to make sure it's really solid scientifically before I write about it and, and put it in print. Because kind of like what Carl just said a little bit earlier, things change. They're always changing. And uh, religions evolve. They're constantly evolving. You would, uh, for example, Melissa, you would be, uh, you would have your head chopped off for dressing the way you're dressing right now. If you had been, if you had been born in France in 1325. Mm. Uh, you, so, and the reason for that would be because you're violating basic Christian principles of how women should dress. And oh, by the way, Carl, you would probably be whip, whipped to death for wearing that shirt because you're you're, you know, not illustrating Jesus properly in uh, the way that um, Calvin said you should in Switzerland. So don't be born in Switzerland in in uh, in 1640, or you'd been you'd have been burned at the stake. So religions are constantly changing in what their values are. And the one thing that seems to be constant in all, all religions, but especially in patriarchal religions, and I want to make a distinction here because there are patriarchal religions and there are non-patriarchal religions, and they do behave differently. When you look at it from an anthropological, sociological, and psychological standpoint, I focus more on patriarchal religions than I do on the non-patriarchal because they're not as well known and they don't impact us today. Wicca, for example, that's a non-patriarchal religion. Uh, witchcraft is a non-patriarchal religion. Cult, um, uh, a lot of the early uh, Middle Eastern religions bef before the Hebrews took them over uh, or, or before Hebrew mythology started were, were non-patriarchal religions. In, in many different ways. A lot of the South Pacific religions were non-patriarchal uh, in the South Pacific Island. But every one of those patriarchal religions does one thing in common, and that is they want to control your sexuality. 
non-patriarch religions aren't as interested in your sexuality. Patriarch religions are. And so I, I asked the question in my book, Sex and God, why is religion so fucking interested in your fucking and your in your sex life? Why? And if you if you dig down below it, you'll realize that if you can control somebody's sexuality, then you control them. And many people say, well, for example, if if I tell you your body is your enemy, which Paul does in the New Testament, over and over again, you get the message that you're you're unclean. You're sinful. You can never be good enough. Your body's unclean. Your body's your enemy. Women are bad. Women are second-class citizens. Women can't speak in public. I mean, you just, the, the list goes on and on and on in patriarchal religions. And it's the same in Mormonism. It's the same in Islam. I'm not picking on Christianity here. They're all the same. And when you, when you, learn, when you see that consistency, you realize that religion really has found a a uh, unique tool for controlling people, and that is their sexuality. If you read Ayan Hershey Ali's book, um, as a Muslim girl being raised in Somalia, you'll see how utterly controlled her life was around her sexuality. And, and of course, up, and, up until today, she has death threats against her because she speaks out against Islam and the treatment of women. So these are these are deeply embedded in Christianity. It, it's almost impossible for a Christian, and I, a Christian's argument to me all day, I, I, can point, I can point to them all the time and say the things that contradict it, but it's almost impossible for a woman and a man to be equal in the, in the Christian religions. And that's not to say that there aren't Christian religions that tend to treat women better than others. But 99% of all the Christian religious denominations that have ever existed, women are second-class citizens. It's just that simple. And if, if they're not, it's a, it's a radical um, exception to the rule. If, uh, let's move on here. What if you're told from the day you're born that masturbation is a sin, and if you do it, you're going to go to hell, and your body is your enemy, and when you do touch your own genitals, you are, you are condemned to hell, or Jesus is going to condemn you, or that's Satan talking to you. I mean, I hear all these things literally every day, and I'll tell you why I hear these every day later, but for right now, just take it in my word, I hear all this shit every single day from people about how they were raised. How does a person who's been shamed for who they are, who their sexuality is, what they do with their own body, from the day they're born, how does that person grow up to be an adult and then how do they parent their own children? And therefore, the, in there lies the passage. It, therein lies the, the way that people get traumatized. I mean, somebody who is scared shitless of masturbating is, is acting unnaturally because almost every mammal species on this planet masturbates. Every primate species on this planet masturbates. We masturbate. And masturbation is the first form of sexuality that any of us will experience. Touching your own genitals. You are the first sex partner you'll ever have. And you may be the last sex partner you ever have. So you need to respect your own body and you had to have autonomy and no religion on this planet should tell you what you can and can't do with your own body. And what you do with somebody else's body, that comes into the realm of ethics and consensual, uh, consensual sexuality. It's another topic I'm not going to go into today, or for right now anyway. So why did I write this book, JK? Because I'm a psychologist. And 80% of the clients that came into my office, and they weren't selected. I mean, I'd go out and say, hey, I just want all the people to meet these criteria. I just took people to walk into my office. 80% of them had sex problems. And when you scratch down below the, sex, the surface of that sex problem, you'll find out I was beaten at five years old for touching my penis. I was shamed by my whole class in, in my Catholic school when they, when they found me not wearing panties. I was thrown out of my house because I come out, came out to my parents as gay at 14. You know, I get this every single day as, as a psychologist in my office. And who's teaching these kids? Who taught the parents these things? It was a patriarchal religion. It was their Baptist minister father. It was their Catholic grandmother. 
it was their Muslim parents. I mean, it was always, always 100% of the time, always a religious root to these ideas. I'll just tell you a quick story. My grandmother, who was a religious fanatic, nutcase, fundamentalist, I loved her, but she, you know, for what I know now, she was, she was mentally ill. But at, at the age of about five years old, I had three brothers younger than me. At, I'm five years old and I'm watching my, my mother change the diapers of my one-year-old youngest brother change the diapers. I may not have been one year old, might have been only six or eight months old. As I'm, I'm sorry, my grandmother, watching my grandmother change my youngest brother's diapers. As I'm watching her change the diapers, remember I'm only five years old. <coughs> my youngest brother laying on the table with his diapers down, reaches down and touches his penis. And my grandmother slaps his hand away from his penis and condemns him for having touched his penis. I am watching this as a five-year-old. Now, my brother, who's now deceased, but at six, eight, 12 months old, he probably doesn't remember that at all. But I remember it. I'm telling you the story right now as if it happened yesterday. That is a religious motivation. My grandmother condemned my six, 12-month-old brother because he did something that was absolutely natural. Who doesn't like to touch their own genitals? And if you don't like to touch your own genitals, if you're uncomfortable touching your own genitals, if you're uncomfortable presenting yourself, where'd you get that idea? It, it wasn't from anything natural. It was from something unnatural, and that unnatural is called religion, patriarchal religions in this case. So I wrote a whole book about it. How does religion, the subtitle, a subtitle of the book is How Religions Distort Sexuality. Now, the way we know this, the way I know this, is I went and did a, a large study of other cultures. And if you look at how other cultures treat sexuality, let's take Hawaii, for example. Before the Hawaiians had contact with the West, they had strict taboos that would get your head cut off. But you know what those two birds were? Those tubers, taboos had to do with eating food. There were certain foods that only the royalty could eat. If you ate that food and you weren't royalty, you got your head cut off. However, you could fuck anybody you wanted. They had almost, they had almost no concept of marriage. The, the only people technically got married in the Hawaiian culture were the royalty. And they oftentimes married brother and sister, no less. But in the lower ranks, there was no, there was no marriage. So th that's a pretty radical difference from what we think of as, quote, marriage or sexuality. I also studied the Mooso from China, <coughs> a very ancient religion, uh, of culture, I mean, and a culture that we know existed and it existed in a very uh, concrete form because Marco Polo visited them in the 1200s and he wrote about them. Here's the interesting thing about the Mooso. They're also called the Na in, uh, in China. They're a culture that doesn't have any word for father or husband. No, there's no marriage in that culture. When a girl becomes uh, menstru menstruates her first time at 13 years old or so, she becomes a full woman. She goes from being a girl to a woman just like that. She also gets the uh, privilege of being, asked, being able to ask men to come into her, her room. She has an outdoor entrance to the compound. The tribe lives in a compound and they, they're hunter gatherers and herders. So she at 13 can now ask any man she wants to come into her home and they can have sex all night. And then he goes back to wherever he came from. They never get married. There's one very important rule among them also. Uh, and if you don't believe what I'm telling you, because it does sound pretty unbelievable, the National Geographic I had an entire spreadsheet uh, spread in the National Geographic on this culture about 20, 2010 or so. You can get a National Geographic and read all about it. But so the one rule they have in this culture is uh, the man has to be out of the house by breakfast. You can't stick around. You got to get out of there. If there's a baby produced by whatever, they, if you went to a Mosa woman and said, hey, who's the, who's the father of this baby? They'd laugh at you. They don't even have an idea. 
they don't even have a concept of cult of fatherhood because the uncles become the father figures. So again, that's a really radically different sexuality than what we see in Christianity. And if you, if you think about it, until Christianity came along, until Islam came along, until Buddhism came along, and until Hinduism came along, I mean, those are the four big ones. If you, if those had never come along, what would human sexuality look like? Because we've, we've been programmed to think that what we see in the West, how we behave in the West is, quote, normal sexuality. But I'm telling you, the Muoso think that's normal sexuality. The Hawaiians think that's normal sexuality. The Amazonian tribes in the, in the Amazon, 26 of them, that believe in something called part of paternity, where they, they, they do have a kind of a marriage, but a woman believes that you'll have a weak and poor and sickly baby if you don't have sex with at least three or four men. So a woman can't have sex with more than one man is seen as a bad candidate for having babies. Now, I'm not saying this is biologically right or wrong. It's ir that's irrelevant. Everything about religion's view on sexuality is biologically wrong. So don't criticize them for being wrong because Christianity is just as wrong about sexuality. So all I tried to do in my book was look at what would sexuality be if we didn't have these patriarchal religions telling people how to be sexual. And there's a lot of ways people could be sexual that are better and worse. I'm not defending any of these other sexualities. And I then turned around and I looked at sexuality from a purely scientific uh, aspect. And what, what are, like for example, it's pretty universal. Masturbation is pretty universal. So if we didn't have religion telling us we can't masturbate, we would probably be masturbating a lot more. And we wouldn't be as guilty or shameful about it. And we'd probably be able to openly talk about it. As I'm talking about right now, I masturbate. I'm 70 fucking years old. I'm not afraid to admit it. Anybody that's afraid to admit they masturbate has been influenced by somebody from a religious background, probably. Uh, Daryl, so, um, like, uh, I think I will add the video like where you uh, say about like uh, in a church, if you ask uh, this question, nobody will <laughs> raise their hand. So that was the funniest thing. Uh, Melissa, I'll uh, yeah. you ask questions. You are uh, very uh, fond of mental health and you have a doctor now, a psychologist and a therapist. So you can ask the questions because I do have a lot of questions like why all the religions consumed with sex and other uh, questions I want to ask. It wasn't really a mental health question. It was more for, you know, Carl, you know, why do you feel like, you know, Christianity or religion in general, they try to control people's, you know, sexuality? Because that, like, you know, Daryl had mentioned, you know, you're not supposed to have sex before a marriage. Or, you know, if somebody comes out as gay, they're especially in the Christian home. The, I mean, it's getting a little bit better, but you know, they see that as you're going straight to hell. So why do you think that that is even a, a thing? I said, I don't think it's a thing, I'm sorry. I know it's not a thing. The problem becomes, I've never seen a cross talk. It's a person that takes what they get in their interpretation and they share what they share. And I appreciate the work uh, that Dr. Ray has done, but there's no way he can do all the work because he's not attended any of my classes. And I have classes about sexuality, about homosexuality, about masturbation in recovery uh, because people in recovery have uh, certain mental problems that they face. And so we've got to look at who's talking uh, and, and what's going on, criticizing, who's criticizing, and how much data do we have. When we go into mental health, one of the things they do is they require you have so much data to show that what you're doing is right. If you don't have good data, you're not going to get a grant. And I remember I listened to uh, Dr. Ray's work, and I remember uh, he talked about uh, people, you know, having rigid relationships 
But then he just referred to his grandmother in which he said that he was happy that she did not force him to think a different way, but kind of gave him some leeway. And so what I'm going to see is, is there are pros and cons from when you evaluate something. You're going to make an assumption based on what you hear. But there's an old saying that says, what, I know you think you heard what I said, but what you heard was not what I meant. And so there's a lot of uh, assumptions that are being made. There's a lot of evolving that is going on currently in the church. Um, he talked about the equality between men and women. I just left a behavioral summit where the scientists are now standing up and saying there is a difference between the man and the woman. The man and the woman have certain chemical balances. They have certain changes. They have certain things that make them unique. Uh, they can't be equal. They're different. They're different creatures. Even people that are transgender, they give them uh, testosterone. Uh, and they give them other chemicals, but you still can't change the brain. And so all I'm saying is, is what we get today is today's pitch. We get today's understanding, but today's understanding is not what it was 300 years ago. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the same 500 years from now. Uh, Carl, on that point, right, I don't want to... Uh pick you on that, right? A simple thing like why we are talking about uh, sex and God and also why major religions are consumed with this uh, uh, taboo of uh, sex as such, right? If you can notice it, like from the Christianity standpoint, what do you uh, say to this, right? Why do they like even say like uh, Jesus was born to a Virgin Mary? Uh, are you so stupid like to even admit that like you are uh, sexually... Uh, abusing everyone by saying this kind of story? Is it even uh, possible like to have a baby uh, being a virgin and you, st you still believe that, right? Anything is possible for God, yes. So yes, if, the, if there is a God creation, so you're talking about a 14 billion uh, year old planet, a planet that it's traveling at the speed of light 186,000 miles a second, it would take billions of years to travel from one end of the universe to the next. We talk about science. Science talks about creativity and mass, and you got to have something that exists. Science will tell you that a, a star uh, uh, has something. It, 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 ex it exists. It will tell you a black hole exists, but now you're going to tell me that the universe did not have a star. And I'm saying there is a design, there is a nature, and somebody that could create a universe that is uh, takes 13 billion years to travel from one end to the next could probably uh, provide a uh, birth from a virgin. Uh, Darrell, uh, you want to take on that? Uh, I, I, well, I, uh, I generally don't argue about the whole existence of God's thing thing because. Uh, I don't have a need to. I'm here to talk about sex, and I'm here to talk about a religion distorts sexuality. And I made a I made an observation that I think we could agree upon scientifically, that all the patriarch religions treat all, all the patriarch religions that I have seen. Of course, Carl may have his own religion, but he, he's the one person in that religion or the small group. But if you look at the vast majority of Muslims, the vast majority of Christians vast majority of Scientologists, the vast majority of Hindus, they treat women as second-class citizens. That's not hard. I mean, it's not hard to document. If you look at the status of women in India, it's India is 148th on the status of women in the United Nations categories. 148. The United States isn't doing that well ourselves. I think last I saw, we're somewhere in the 50s. So we're not, we don't treat women that much better and look at Islam. So, I mean, Saudi Arabia is something in the 190s for the treatment of women. Well, why are women treated this way if it's not for religion? You look at Sweden and the status of women. You look at Norway and the status of women. Look at Denmark, the status of women. They, religion has almost no say in those countries. And yet women are virtually equal to men. 
religion, I, I never read anything in the New Testament that said women and men are equal. And I hear Carl arguing that women and men are not equal. Well, I don't know what equal means. I do know that people should be treated under the law the same. Biology is biology. And we know that there's differences, but there's differences between any two men. There's differences between 22 women. Basing something on the color of someone's skin or their gender is not, is, is not appropriate in this day and age, period. So I'm going to tell you that women and men, blacks and whites, Asians, they're all equal under the law, period. It does not mean we're biologically equal in whatever that means. No, I'm not going to run any races in the Olympics and win. I am not equal to an Olympic runner. But that means that does nothing to say with whether I should be treated differently in some way, whether I should get a job or not, whether I should be promoted or not, you know, whether I, I should be have, have political benefits that someone else doesn't, whether I should be able to vote or not. I mean, think about that. Right now, we're in a huge fight in Georgia right now that's basically, basically being created to stop blacks from voting in Georgia because black people got out and voted big time and elected Joe Biden and two, two uh, senators, one of whom was black. And the white supremacists don't like that. White supremacy is basically based on religion, period. QAnon is a religion and it came right out of Christianity. You cannot deny White supremacist goes right back to the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan were the best Christians in America, in their estimation, not in mine for sure. You you can just take all these things I'm talking about. This is not this is not Daryl speaking. This is pretty pretty easy to document. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't blacks hanging whites in the in Reconstruction era. That's for sure. And who was what was their symbol? It was a cross. It was a it was a Christian cross. And remember, the Baptist Church had in its founding documents from 1848 that slavery was perfectly appropriate because it was it was endorsed by God in both New Testament and Old Testament. And oh, by the way, the Baptist Church didn't see fit to take it out of its founding documents until 1978. 1978. That's that's unconscionable. And the only reason they took it out is because they got so much pressure. To, from the culture to evolve, to change. But uh, there's a lot of Southern Baptist churches right now that are lily white. You know, begin to ask questions, is there a lot of racism in, in Christianity? Well, hell yes, there's a lot of racism because Christianity is based on racism, especially in the United States. So I can go on and on about that, but yeah, that, uh, debating that, God is not my purpose here today. Yeah, Carl, uh, you can ask a question. You can interrupt me. Add to what he said because again, uh, we kind of making each other's points uh, because it's the people, it's the guys with the white robes that have the problem. It's it's not the religion. The Bible doesn't have any scripture that says black people are bad. But I can tell you from my community, there are black people that embrace Islam because they believe that the white people during slavery leveraged Christianity and used it to manipulate the masses of black people. So consequently, they say we should do Islam because Christianity is a religion designed to manipulate people. That's not necessarily true. It's not totally false either. We can go back. They also said that the Samaritans were an impure religion. Uh, and they tell a story in the Bible about Jesus and the woman at the well. And the, they both worked at the same place. They worshiped at the same mount. Uh, we can even go back in Islam, Judea, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, all of which will claim Abraham, all of which will claim Jerusalem as the city. My point, and I think uh, Dr. Ray's point somewhat says the same thing is my point is it's not necessarily the origin that's the problem, but the interpretation that the human being gives to that religion. Right. So you just think that people are just taking what they want to take pretty much and then they interpret it the way that they want. And it's not really religion at all that's, you know, causing 
things like the KKK or different people to be so, you know, against certain cultures or races or how they feel. Okay. Yeah, I, I happen to belong to one of the most sexist uh, strands of Christianity that's so small that most people don't think about what's called Church of Christ. But Church of Christ does not believe you can, women are not even supposed to speak before a man, you know? Uh, I have arguments because I stir the pot. I study enough religion and I study enough history that what I do is I deliberately start arguments that I don't even believe in. But I do it in order to create <laughs> because there's a theory, significant emotional event. What you do is try to help people see where the flaws are and you do that with a significant emotional bent. It could be from hugging them and kissing them. It could be a slapping them with a two by four, but it's gotta be a significant emotional event. So when I go to the elders meeting and I tell them that I'd like to hear Sister Jones preach on Sunday, I know what I'm gonna get. Uh, 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 Carl, that's interesting because I was raised in the Church of Christ as well. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we were the instrumental church of Christ. We, uh, we had actually instruments, but you know, uh, you guys were going to hell because you don't have instruments, right? Exactly. Okay. That's what my grandmother taught me. I want to correct one little thing. Cause my grandmother was an asshole. She was not, she was not kind. She did not uh, give me the, she was not gentle. She, as you described, I think you misunderstood what I said and her throwing my hand, my brother's hand away was a sign of how she viewed sexuality. I could go into a lot of the, my own family is a great example of absolutely fucked up sexuality. Um, and I could see it throughout my, my family, including my own parents. For example, my mother got Jesus when she was, my dad was 12 years old. She got Jesus with a vengeance. She got infected bad. And as a result, she decided my 12 year old father who was not circumcised needed to get circumcised. Remember, this is my grandmother making the decision for him. And she forces my father to go get circumcised without anesthesia. Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. And that <laughs> scarred my father literally for life. Now, I understand it because I was, I was there. I wasn't there when he was 12 years old, of course. But he raised me and I got to talk to him. And I got to see the tears in his eyes as he told me how this affected him. And I know darn good and well, it was done directly as a relationship to the way my grandmother viewed her religion. And she could not be right with Jesus if she had not got her child circumcised. It's kind of crazy because the Bible itself does not say that. <laughs> In fact, Paul says, you don't have to be circumcised or uncircumcised. You know, he just was trying to get people to come into church, his, his particular church. So there's, there's a lot of damage that comes from this religious idea. I'm going to agree and disagree, and I think this is an interesting discussion. Carl, I appreciate you uh, engaging today. First of all, I'm going to agree that religions are constantly changing and people are constantly changing their beliefs, and they're constantly looking at different scriptures in the Bible to confirm what they already believe. That, I, that is really unassailable. We, we can document that over centuries. So that piece I totally agree with. The, the one assumption you make underneath this, I would disagree with, and that is that there's some, quote, pure religion. There's something pure that you seem to know in particular, but it seems to be a secret to the Mormons. It seems to be evade the Baptists. The, the Muslims don't seem to understand it either. So I get this frequently, Carl, from a lot of different Christians I talk to and Muslims is that, well, that's not my religion. And when they start to describe their religion or what they believe, and then it's, it's in the Bible, I can go to the next person over and say, well, what about you? And they will point to a whole different set of ver verses in the Bible, again, to verify what they already believe. So what I ask everybody is, where do I find this pure Christianity? Where, is this, where do I find this Christianity that cannot be misinterpreted? Where I find this Christianity that came directly from some supernatural being writing it down. I have not found anybody, although Islam does say that supernatural being, and Christianity tries to say that, 
I just, so this notion that there's a pure form of a religion and, oh, you just don't know that pure form. I'm the only one that seems to know it. That's always an argument I can't buy. Yeah, Daryl, uh, thank you. I think we are running out of time because you, oh, yeah. you are not well and I made you excited and <laughs> you went over uh, more than an hour. And uh, thank you so much. Before we wrap it up, because I uh, want to be mindful of uh, your uh, time and also your health, right? I'm uh, more concerned about that. Uh, can you just give us a quick glimpse of what inspired you uh, to start this secular secular therapy project or recovering from religion? Yeah, I, I thank you. I appreciate that. And I just want to say thank you, guys. This has been a great conversation. Carl, I always love talking to Christians that are willing to talk. So you and I, I have great admiration for you. Thank you for coming today. I, I do want to talk about those two, Secular Therapy Project and Recovering from Religion, um, uh, if you would, JK, because they're near and dear to my heart. I spent the last 12 years organizing these, these, these two organizations. First of all, Secular Therapy Project, I started in 2012 because there's a lot of psychologists out there using new age bullshit and religious bullshit as therapy. Jesus cannot cure your, your depression. Jesus has no say over your schizophrenia or your bipolar disorder. So we need science-based, evidence-based methods. And uh, it's hard to find a therapist who meets those criteria. So we, uh, we opened up our database in 2012 People can apply to us that have, that are licensed, have the proper credentials and are secular. They have to be secular. They cannot be religious and be in our database. There's lots of Christian counselors out there. You have no trouble finding them. They advertise on every street corner. But finding a secular therapist is much more difficult because in our culture, it's very difficult to call yourself secular. No judge will send anybody to you. No minister certainly will send you to anybody to you even though you're using the best, most scientifically validated methods. So we have to kind of help people stay under the radar so they can find a secular therapist, somebody who uses evidence. So if you need mental health care and you want it from somebody who's not going to say Jesus is your problem or Jesus is your solution, either one, they're there to be neutral. They're not there to convert or deconvert. They're there to use science to help you get over your depression. Go to secondtherapy.org, hit the button and register as a client, and then you'll be able to search our database. We have 489 therapists registered, vetted, qualified. You can, and you can do oftentimes online therapy with them, especially if they're within your own state or country. Uh, if you really want to understand what we're trying to do, go to the other side of that same page. It says register or apply to be a therapist. Hit that button and read what we require of our therapists. And you'll see that it's, it's a pretty high standard we set for people to become a therapist in our database. They're generally always are going to have to have at least a master's degree. They're going to have to be licensed. They have to be mental health professionals. They have to be secular. And we verify all those, all three of those criteria before we let them in. So that's the Secular Therapy Project. Uh, two years earlier, three years earlier in 2009, after I wrote The God Virus, I... Uh, found a need that people were saying, I left my religion and my parents disowned me. I left my religion and my wife divorced me. I, I can't continue to do this religion anymore and my family's disowning me. And so I, heard, I saw a lot of loneliness, a lot of need for community. And so I started recovering from religion and it's specifically designed and our volunteers are trained to help people with their journey, no matter where they are. And we don't care if you're religious or not. That's, that's irrelevant. We're here to help you with your journey. If you need help finding a different church, we'll help you find a different church. If you help need getting out of the church, we'll help you. If you need help finding a community that isn't going to tell you you're going to hell, we'll help you find that. So you can, you can go to recoverfromreligion.org. You can hit the chat button in the lower left-hand side. And you can just chat with somebody and say, hey, I'm having trouble. I'm struggling. I don't believe in hell anymore, but I still believe in God. Okay, we can help you. We've got thousands of resources. We have spent years putting a gigantic library together to help people deal with any aspect that would be encountered in leaving any religion. And I mean any religion. We have, we have resources for leaving Hinduism. 
We have resources for leaving Scientology. You name the religion, we probably got a resource for it. And every phase of life, you know, how do I raise my, where do I raise my parents? I mean, how do I lay, raise my children uh, in a secular way? We can, we can help you there. Uh, how do I teach my children positive sexual values? We can help you there. There's lots and lots of things that we can do. And if you want a community, you can even chat with us and ask to join our community. We have a, a wide variety of communities. If you're an ex-Baptist, you might want to text ex-Baptist. If you're a wife, former wife of a Baptist minister, you can get in. We've got a whole group of people talking about what it's like to be a wife of a Baptist minister. So there's all sorts of ex-Mormons, ex-Muslims, you name it. And then we also have local groups that meet, you know, face to face in places like Orlando, Florida or Los Angeles or London, England. And they sit down when we're not having a pandemic and we just talk to each other about recovery issues. It's um, pretty That's good. A great, great organizations that you started. Because I know some people, they may be religious, but they don't want to talk about that in their therapy or, you know, they are trying to get out of it. And that's really great. I'm going to look that up myself. <laughs> okay. I want to give you an assignment, Melissa. Go, All right. go hit the chat button and just chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't, you don't even have to have an agenda. I, I want to tell you, we've got over 275 trained volunteers and they're all damn well trained. We, we don't let anybody touch our clients unless they know what they're doing. Okay. So uh, just chat, experience it. Go in there. Uh, Carl, go in there and hit chat button and say, hey, I'm a Christian, but I just want to find out what you guys are all about. Yeah. And find okay. out if they treat you respectfully or not. That's because <laughs> we are adamant. We do not care who chats in with us. We will treat you respectfully no matter what. Now, sometimes they don't treat us respectfully, but we always will treat them respectfully. <laughs> we try to practice what Jesus said there. <laughs> uh, that's a like wonderful it. thing. Like, uh, thank you, Daryl. Uh, Carl, do you. you have any final comments like before we yeah, wrap this call? And definitely, I would love to uh, argue or debate and talk more with you both. And uh, it's been an honor and pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, I just thought it was a refreshing conversation, uh, a good agreeing to disagree, and actually to come together on some points as well. Many people will understand, especially because I am in the behavioral health field, and I work with mental health and substance misuse, uh, many people are scarred by the trauma of what they've gone through. Uh, the thing that happened to Dr. Ray's dad was traumatic. And right now, uh, they're changing what they call codependency. Here you got somebody that's loving, they're in a relationship, they're trying to help their sick, uh, addicted brother or sister or, or wife or husband, and we want to tell them they're sick. You got the problem. No, they don't have a problem. Why would you traumatize somebody that is already going through trauma. So I think it's really good that we explore opportunities. I will be talking to people because that's how I learn stuff. I learn by be keeping an open mind, asking questions and continuing to research. Um, thank you, Carl, again. Uh, Daryl, thank you. Uh, Melissa, you can make the closing comment. And uh, uh, Daryl, just to uh, give an update, I had a life mission to deconvert Carl from Christianity. <laughs> Let Carl be. He's a great guy. I think if, if, he needs, if, he, if he needs what he has, then great. I need what I have. There's nothing wrong with either one of us. <laughs> Well, that's great. This actually was a very good conversation. And Daryl, I'm all the way going to check that out. So <laughs> uh, thank you guys both for joining us. And thank you for returning again, Carl. And yes, this was a great show. But I'm um, going to have to wrap it up, guys. So <laughs> we will see you all another time. And bye for now. See you later. Bye, everybody. Stop now. A social experiment enterprise. Stop, listen, share. Everyone can make a difference. We are on a mission.
everyone should do something greater in their lifetime. Change the future. Be a proud member. Join us to support, volunteer, and donate.